So a little introduction and then I will hand it off to you. I apologize in advance to everyone if my dogs bark. They're having a moment tonight apparently. So that's where we're at. Okay. So welcome to today's session, everyone. Uh, my name is Trinity and I'm a member of Pre-Med CC, which is a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. We know how challenging finding mentorship can be, especially in the middle of a pandemic. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone who wants to join. We realize that finding mentorship and guidance in a pre-med journey could be especially challenging for first-generation med students, people that lack the financial resources, or those that just do not know anyone in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can join us from the comfort of your own home or wherever you happen to be. We typically have events uh, Fridays 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. PST, and also on Saturday mornings, typically at 11 a.m. PST. Uh, good news though, if you aren't able to join us at those times, all of our events are recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel for viewing at a later date uh, for your convenience. After you have completed or attended our event, make sure to go onto our website uh, within a couple of days after the event to take the quiz. And if you receive a 70% or higher on the quiz, you will get a certificate uh, certifying that you attended the hours uh, of shadowing that you attended at the event today. And last but not least, if you wanna stay connected with us and make sure you're up to date on all of our upcoming events, please follow us on all of our social media platforms. Uh, TikTok's not on here, but we are also on TikTok and all of our handles are at PremedCC. Uh, so when you get a chance, go over to your social media and follow us so that you know what's coming up down the pipeline for our events. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, do a brief introduction of our speaker, and then I will hand it off to him. Dr. Soriano is a native of California who grew up in Northern Long Beach. He is the youngest of three sons and his parents were refugees from El Salvador. He attended Long Beach Polytechnic High School where he ran track and played football. After graduation in 2011, he attended Long Beach City College for three transformative years where he was a president ambassador, Phi Theta Kappa All-State Academic Team Member and volunteer at St. Francis Medical Center in Linwood, California. He joined Me Mentor and MedPet as a freshman, which catalyzed his interest in working for the underserved and mentoring the next generation of medical professionals. He earned his Bachelor's of Science degree from UCLA in 2016 and medical degree from UC Davis School of Medicine, three-year accelerated track in 2021. Prior to starting medical school, he spent two gap years working for UCLA Rheumatology as the Clinical Information Manager. He is currently a resident physician of internal medicine at UCLA. During his academic journey, he was named the Hispanic Scholar Fund Scholar of the Year, involved as VP of Educational Pathways with Me Mentor, educated, educated low-income students as a STEM instructor, tutored students K through 12, and has been teaching assistant at UC Davis undergrads and medical students in anatomy. His interests as a clinician and a teacher include working for the underserved, mentorship, preventative medicine, and primary care internal medicine. Awesome. Thank you very much, Trinity, for that wonderful introduction. I have a, um, uh, I want to share uh, my screen here so that we can get my PowerPoint underway. Thank you all for joining, whether, whether you are in a car, on your way home from work, or if you are on your you know, break from lunch, if you are on your break from studying for your midterms, from OCHEM, those all bring back bad memories for me. But either way, my name is Dr. Christopher Andres Soriano. I am a physician resident at UCLA Ronald Reagan here in Los Angeles. And uh, it's an honor for me to be speaking to you all today. Um, really, programs like these conferences or, you know, Zoom meetings, Zoom sessions, webinars like these are where it all started for me. This is really the catalyst for the reason why I'm standing before you today with the comma MD behind my name, uh, among other things. Um, so I was in your, your seats, you know, 10 years ago with the same bright eyes, listening to a, a Latino physician or someone from my similar background speaking, you know, just their dream in, into my life. And uh, I'm happy to be that voice for you guys today. 
Um, I want to start off by doing an active exercise, actually. I want you all to uh, uh, speak your dream into existence right now. I know you're all muted, but I kind of want you to either put into the comments what your dream is, uh, where you see yourself in 10 years, or just tell your, your, your peers next to you, your colleagues, your family, whoever's close by, tell them what you're going to be. Um, I want you to say it out loud. Um, so, uh, you know, I heard, you know, probably some of you are thinking maybe, you know, you want to be me. Uh, in the next 10 years, but I want you guys to go beyond that, okay? Um, I'm old news now. You guys are the next generation. So, uh, you know, now that I have your attention, I kind of want to try another exercise. Um, I want you to close your eyes and imagine that you've been blessed to live to the age of 100 years, uh, but you're alone in your home, in your bed, and your time is coming. Now, imagine in five seconds, you will take your last breath, but before you take that last breath, you say it was worth it. Now, open your eyes. Um, and ask yourself, what do you have to do now to be able to say that in the future, right? So uh, the question that I just presented to you was presented to me actually by an admissions director at Stanford School of Medicine years ago when I was at a SUMA conference there, um, when I was deciding between five, four, and three-year medical degree programs uh, when I gained admission. So this really had me thinking, uh, you know, it wasn't even about my dream of becoming a doctor. My realization was much more subtle than that. It was literally just me achieving happiness and being happy in this lifetime. You know, then I understood and everything else became so easy. So, you know, I ask you all, what is your purpose? And upon thinking of this, I, I came to the conclusion that my purpose is to give service in any way, shape or form to others, regardless if they needed it or not. Um, you know, I volunteer my time and effort to these things because I love them and I thoroughly enjoy it with a passion. I'm not trying to boost my resume or fulfill the cookie cutter requirements that are needed to get into medical school or residency of my dreams beyond. Um, I, must, I am myself, I compare myself to no one as you shouldn't compare yourself to anyone. The only reason why you should compete with yourself, uh, the only person you should compete with is your old self really, uh, because they're ultimately the ones that hold you back um, in retrospect. Um, and like you all, I have my own story, so um, I'm not gonna try to live someone else's, right? Um, so, I've fallen in love with success and I'm cheating on failure at this point. Why? Because, you know, like a great rapper once said, mama need a house, baby needs some shoes. Times are getting hard. Guess what I'm gonna do? Hustle, hustle, hustle hard. Shout out to Ace Hood. You guys are probably too young to, to know that rapper, but um, that was my anthem back in the day. When I was going in for an OCHEM exam, when I was going in for a physics exam, that's what I was bumping in my, in my iPod uh, uh, headphones that had strings back then. They weren't uh, a cordless like yours these days. Um, just like you guys probably listen to your TikTok songs before you get hyped, you know, I, those, that was my anthem. So, um, you know, it hasn't always been easy, though. Um, you know, I, I welcome failure because human endeavor is built on failure. Uh, you look at any history book and I encourage you to get comfortable with the uncomfortable uh, because that's really how you overcome adversity and get ahead. Um, if it isn't difficult, you know, then it really isn't worth doing. You know, there's a lot of diminishing, diminishing return with things that are just too easy. And in the pursuit of achieving your ultimate potential of manifesting your dream, if you fall short, then the journey and your new baseline threshold of what was once hard is now easy. So you will have grown so much and, and that already is a win for, for any young uh, student. Uh, failure only defines you if you haven't learned from it. I want you to know yourself and know your worth. You know, these letter grades that you achieve in class are only a mere side effect of what is going on in your life in that snapshot of moment of time. They are not the end goal. The goal is to learn. So my, my bachelor's degree and my medical degree won't define me as a person. It's my service and hard work that I've done throughout this journey that will. And I want you to honor yourself and honor those who love you because people that care will respect you for what you've done. Uh, that brings me to my next question of, what is your biggest fear? Um, what is the one thing that you are most afraid of? You know, tell it to yourself now. Um, and if you have a dream and are afraid to pursue it because you are afraid of not succeeding, then you need to overcome that fear ASAP. Self-doubt would be your biggest obstacle, I tell you that. Um, once you overcome that, then the world opens up to you. You know, um, the dream you just spoke into existence, by the way, is now closer because you put it into the universe, right? I once had a fear that I would never be good enough, not smart enough. I felt like I was 10 steps behind everybody, everybody else. You know, they didn't have to grow up like the same struggles that me and my brothers had. Um, but I later learned, you know, I had something called imposter syndrome. I was like, what? Oh, I, I, I thought that was just a personal thing, you know, but a lot of people have it. And once I let that go, let go of that fear, then opportunities started to present themselves as if to say I was ready for the responsibility and the opportunity. 
attending community college for me back in the day, right after high school was the best decision I ever made because that is where I discovered my true potential. It was like a second chance that I really needed to save my life. You know, the environment was welcoming. It enabled me to blossom into a leader uh, within my community that I, even, I never even knew I could become, uh, you know, and thinking of 50% of community college students are Latinx, but we only make up five to 6% of physician population, uh, as well as African-American population, you know, we're, 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 we're not represented. And so as a pre-med student, one of the first things I learned was that education is the number one social determinant of health. So if we approach education as a method of saving lives, then we can achieve greatness. So that is why I became a doctor to service, to, you know, bring service to others through the form of education and medicine, kind of marry the two favorite things that, that I am passionate about. One of the biggest obstacles in my life, however, is not been financial, not family issues, but actually myself. You know, I want you all to remember that only you can determine what your future will hold. It, it used to be, show me your five friends and I will show you your future. But now I believe it's show me how many social apps you have downloaded and I'll show you your midterm score. Um, you know, distractions will always be there, but you can't, you, you, you can control them. Um, you know, you're not in this alone. I have had the help of many people along this journey. Um, you know, when you seek out opportunities, I guarantee that a door will eventually open. I have not reached my full potential yet, uh, even as a human. I still make mistakes, um, but they are a learning process. And I don't want any of you to be discouraged when you feel as though you have failed, because when you win, it'll feel that much better knowing that your hard work paid off. Um, you know, I recall one of my mentors who now happens to be a COO of a medical group here in Southern California. He asked me what a modern CEO, what a modern day leader looks like. And he addressed the myth that, that you and I both have heard that a CEO was the most intelligent person with the highest IQ. And that is why they are so influential. But he brought up this other concept that I was unfamiliar with of EQ, which is emotional intelligence, which you might, may have heard. Um, and that's the ability to connect with other people on an emotional level and inspire others to achieve greatness. You know, and, and that's the kind of modern day leader that I, I strive to be. You know, I was a little behind on the IQ stuff, but I'm, I'm slowly catching up. But I, at least I had my EQ going for me. Um, you know, it doesn't matter how smart I am. If I can establish a good relationship with a patient, who believes they don't need medications for their heart failure, then my knowledge means nothing, right? Um, it's just gone to waste if I can't connect with someone. So that inspired me to become more involved. And it all started when I heard that change happens when someone says something is wrong. And you know, when we embrace this elephant in the room and we let our voice to connect, we inspire and affect change in our communities. You know, this, this, this world is, is the oyster and you're the pearl, so you, you, be, you best believe you gotta shine. Um, some of you are like the blossoming apple on a tree waiting to hit Isaac Newton on the head for making physics a problem for me in college. So I appreciate you. Um, some people ask me where I get my passion from. And uh, I tell them that it's, it's a lot bigger than me now. I, I know too much to just sit by. Uh, I am no longer doing this for myself. It started out that way, uh, you know, by being selfish, but now it's to just better myself so I can ultimately give back to others and, and just build this empire. Um, leaders come in many different shapes and forms. Uh, if you can be your own leader, you can be your biggest advocate uh, when other people aren't supportive of your dreams. Um, if you are the first person in your family to give college a try, then that's a huge stepping stone. You know, think about all your siblings and cousins that you will inspire. If your family is not supportive, don't blame them because they honestly don't know what they don't know. Um, try to educate them. Get your family on board with what you want to accomplish. Let them know what your dream is and, and let them help you speak it into existence. I cannot stress the importance and credit that I owe to pre-health organizations like, like Pre-Med CC for my current and future success. You know, Pre-Med CC was a community and family that I needed in order to access the leader embedded in all of our DNA. Uh, you know, through workshops like these, speakers like myself, I learned how to network and build interpersonal relationships with, with mentors, with people who are professionals uh, who never would have given me a chance, you know, had they heard how I spoke before I became educator or or look how I dressed or look who I hung, up, hung out with, right? Um, I remember someone saying, you have to network for your net worth and health is wealth. And those two things really stuck with me. You know, I had to learn proper etiquette and professionalism to where I am now confident in my ability to network with others in a, in a professional manner. You know, for some program directors at these medical schools and hospitals, we are the first people that look and sound like us. So, you know, we have to make a good impression. Um, if there's any advice I can give to you today, it's to just be proactive and to be a go-getter. You know, nothing will be handed to you, so you have to be hungry. Um, there are millions of dollars in scholarships out there, and you can go to college uh, and medical school for free. Uh, I'm living proof of that. 
you know, you don't have to believe the hype that people say you will be in debt. Uh, you know, I relieved the financial burden on my parents through scholarships and I'll forever be grateful to those stewards and those, those pioneers for their support and investment in my dream. Um, you know, education has opened up many more opportunities for me than I could have ever imagined. It truly has been a fun trip. Uh, growing up, I was naturally a follower. I have two older brothers, so it was natural for me to follow behind in their footsteps, whatever they did. Um, but this was really the first time I kind of took my life into my own hands. Um, the biggest role models in my life have been my parents. You know, uh, they instilled these morals and ethics in me and my brothers, and I, I basically owe everything to them. But it was difficult navigating through the educational system, especially since my brothers and I were first generation students. You know, my parents just got here. Um, so we had to just start everything from scratch. You know, and having parents that emigrated from El Salvador, you know, my brothers and I surpassed my parents' formal education when we barely entered high school, you know. Uh, so seeing my parents work hard day in and day out, uh, basically working doctor's hours, but with a fraction of the pay, you know, that made me realize that they were doing all of this for us to have a better future. I mean, can you imagine what a blessing it was to grow up poor and then now be a physician and see the two, the two sides of the, the story, the perspective? It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, so, you know, it's, 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 it's my mom and dad made me change my trajectory. Um, and they, they forever changed the, the history of, of our bloodline in just one generation, just, just with their sacrifice. And, and I just have to honor them by continuing to push forward. So, you know, we're, we're building this empire. You guys are all part of it. And, you know, my parents took on the biggest burden. Your parents took on the biggest burden so that my, myself, my brothers, you all, can be the first ones to take a crack at this American dream. And, you know, um, I have full faith that you guys will all complete it. So, you know, now that I'm viewed as its leader in, uh, in the community, I see a lot of youth naturally gravitate towards me and ask for advice. And it's an honor to be respected in this light, really. You know, it's funny, the, the mentee myself has become a mentor. It's, it's weird. But I've been led this far by a group of mentors through MedPEP, Mi Mentores, and DEP, ESHPEP, you know, UC Davis School of Medicine, uh, which is transformative experience, and now UCLA back home, uh, where, you know, most of it all started. Uh, so, you know, it's my turn to need, lead the next person in line. And, you know, I, I take every single advice I get and apply it in life. So I want you all to do the same. Don't be afraid to ask for help because people who are afraid to ask are people who are afraid to learn. After all, ignorance is bliss. Um, you know, having gone to community college for three years, obtained my bachelor's degree from UCLA in two years, and graduated medical school from UC Davis in three years, and now entering in my second year of internal medicine residency, the best part of this all has just been the journey. So I suggest you all to just enjoy the process because you never know, you know, 10 years from now, you, you're you going to be giving this speech to, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> the next generation. So uh, I want to thank all of you in attendance uh, in, in hearing my story. Um, and supporting our dreams together. You know, I'm here for you. And I would like to share my dream with you at this time. So I, Christopher Soriano, uh, a son of Salvadoran refugees who attended his first pre-med conference in 2012, 10 years ago, uh, became an internal medicine physician at Ronald Reagan UCLA. And uh, soon you will be the next in line in the blink of an eye. So um, thank you all, I appreciate it. The first question that someone has put in the Q&A is, I graduate this semester from university. My GPA is not the best. What can I do to increase my GPA? Yeah, I think there's, there's lots of things to consider, you know, especially being, you know, what, what's your, your science GPA, your cumulative GPA, kind of what, what your story is, your background, uh, lots of factors that admissions look at when they are uh, accepting people uh, to their medical schools, you know, being your MCAT score. Um, you know, I have uh, lots of friends who have taken the route of doing post back pro programs. I've had people who have taken non-traditional classes at community college to boost their GPA. And in one year's time, you know, they reapply or apply to medical school. Um, so it, it, I, would, I would encourage you to get in touch with uh, a mentor at the medical school that you are trying to pursue and speak to an advisor and ask them what the next step should be. Um, whether it's in the form of studying for the MCAT implying, or if it's taking other courses, retaking classes to boost your GPA. But ultimately, um, you know, this is a part of your story. This is a part of your personal statement. And 
uh, your perseverance uh, is going to pay off uh, uh, tremendously. The next question we have is, what is something you wish you knew before starting medical school? One thing I wish I knew before starting medical school, I wish I knew a little bit more about... That's a good question because everything happens for a reason and I don't wish anything was different, but one thing I wish I knew was perhaps how to probably save money or make money through medical school while not working in a sense. Um, because financially, right, you're, you're sacrificing what, 10 years uh, essentially of, of no income uh, if you choose this route, eventually, of course, it pays off. You, you guys have seen the charts, but you know there is a a, a time where you won't be making enough <laughs> to really go to Hawaii or go to Europe, like your other friends on Instagram are showing. But this is a part of that sacrifice, and we all know that this field requires that, and it's a sacrifice that eventually pays off. But I think I just would have preferred a, a more financial savvy background. But again, growing up poor, you don't really have that to, to bank off of. So again, it, there's nothing you could have done, um, but just maybe applying to more scholarships, reaching out to other people to help fund your experience, I think would have been, would have been useful. The next question we have is, I started out not so strong in community college, but I am bringing my GPA up gradually. Is it still possible I can get into a good university? 100%, 100%. You, you are exactly the person that they're looking for. Um, you're a person who has a story. Uh, I, I can tell that you've grown tremendously just by uh, you know, increasing your GPA. The fact that you're even here on a Friday uh, at 5, 6 p.m., you know, working towards your future says a lot about who you are and who you will become. So just continue. You're on the right track. Um, I would implore you to take advantage of all of your professor's office hours, take advantage of all tutoring, take advantage of everything that your school has to offer. You have to be the person that knows about it. Be that person that's always nosy, always raising your hand so that you know the secrets to get an A. And once you know the strategy to getting an A, the rest is history. You've secured the bag. Next question is, did you finish all of your prerequisite courses at community college? Yeah, I did a good job uh, because I was in close connection with the UCLA Transfer Center. Um, we had a transfer coordinate alliance uh, from Long Beach City College to UCLA. So I, I was like in there always, I was knocking on doors, I was sending emails. I was annoying, honestly. But uh, I knew that that's what I had to do to, to ensure my, my seat, my spot in that, in that program. So I transferred into microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics at UCLA. It was tough to get in, but um, it was what I was passionate about at the time. And um, you know, I, I, I think that um, you just have to do what you gotta do. Mm -hmm. Next question is, what is the toughest part about your residency? And then sort of the opposite of that is, what is the most rewarding? Yeah, I think the most rewarding thing is, is you've developed all this knowledge, all this basic sciences in, 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 in college, and then in medicine and medical school, you build up all the clinical skills. And then residency is where you put it all to practice. That's where you really shine. So it's nice to be able to just think, right? All, all I do is I show up to work and I think. I use my brain. You know, my parents, they show up and they use their hands, they use their back, they use their knees, they use their muscles. I don't have to work that hard. All I'm doing is exercising my brain and what I've learned and been trained to do. So it, it's beautiful to see someone come in really, really sick, you know, and they're a loved one. They're someone's grandma, they're someone's mother. And I nurse them back to health or I doctor them back to health, you know, in, in a few days and, and, and seeing how grateful the family is and seeing how grateful the patient is and educating them on how to prevent themselves from being readmitted for the same preventable disease, that, that's really uh, gratifying for me. Um, the flip side of that is when, you know, you're not able to help a patient, unfortunately, when, you know, they've come to the end of their, their chronic disease and, and they're in the ICU and you can't do anything to save them, but uh, you ensure a comfortable, you know, um, we call it a celestial discharge for them and their families, one that's uh, brings closure and 
is healing for everyone as they pass on naturally. The next question is, how did you obtain a good study schedule to get through all the tough classes? Studying, I became a pro at that uh, when I entered in community college. I was, I was, let's not even talk about what I did in high school. That's, that's irrelevant. That person's gone. But college is when I really reinvented myself. I, I, I went up to the smartest person in class. And I say smartest, meaning the person who was asking all the questions, the person who got that A on the first quiz, the person who was like in office hours and asking all the right questions. I went up to that person. I said, dude, teach me everything. Like, what do you, what, what do you know? What's the secret? What do you know that I don't? So literally held my hand, showed me the way, go to office hours. You do, you preview, review, and do was his whole thing. So you preview, if say you're going into a chemistry uh, chapter five, you already go in having read that whole chapter and you're just sitting by taking notes. And then you're just clarifying questions on the spot. Boom, you're already ahead of everyone else. And then you review when you're done, you go to office hours and confirm everything that you just learned and boom, guess what? You're already a week ahead of schedule. So by the time your midterm comes around, you're just basically chilling, right? So uh, just really tapping in, finding that, that, that group that's gonna motivate you to want to learn and is eager to learn and it's putting in the work. Don't, don't, feel free to start sacrificing some friends, you know, in the sense that if they're not good for you, just get rid of them. Like it's, they're just gonna be a bigger obstacle at this point. So. Uh, find a find a new set of people who have uh, the same goals as you. Honestly, that that's the best thing you can do. The next question is: In your experience, do you think that where you got your undergrad degree from matters? For example, UC versus a private institution. Yeah, it, it's hard to say, right? Because I I know nothing else, but um, I have plenty of friends who are in my residency who went to you know, who didn't go to University of California systems, they went to other private institutions, they went to other public uh, universities, Cal States, for example, um, and out of state uh, programs that you've never even heard of, but um, it doesn't matter. Uh, we're all here, we're, we're all passionate and, and admissions committees all saw that. Yeah, we were passionate and manifested in good grades and manifested in uh, extracurricular activities that showed that we were passionate, it showed in our letters of recommendation right? It's not just about getting a good grade at so-and-so school, right? You can do that anywhere. Biochemistry is biochemistry at Harvard versus Compton University if Compton had one. That'd be tight if they did. Um, but uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, you're going to end up here if you want to end up here and, and nothing's going to stop you. The next question is, how do you balance out academic and pre-med requirements with your other passions, such as volunteering? Yeah, it, it's a delicate balance. And, and again, it goes back to sacrifice. So, you know, one thing I knew right away was like sitting my family down, sitting my significant other, who's now my, my wife, and uh, sitting down my other friends, you know, I, individual times, of course, and just telling them like, yo, this is what I want to do. Apparently, this is what I have to do to get there. And this is how our relationships are going to kind of take a hit. And so just kind of mapping that out, making sure everyone's on board with the journey that you're about to embark on, uncharted waters um, is important up front. So being up front, you know, in expectations. Um, so sacrifice is big. Um, and then managing all your extracurriculars, you know, it's going to feel like a checklist, but again, you're, you're, feeding, you're feeding that passion. So aside from studying physics, you know, and getting your midterm score, you're also going to volunteer at the hospital or at a local food shelter or a free clinic or, or scribing for a, a doctor. Um, and that's what's going to feed what your ultimate passion is, and that's taking care of patients, right? So uh, you have to feed that, that beast inside of you because that's, that's only going to reinforce the flame and catalyze this fire. Um, you can't just be a bookworm. Um, so use the extracurriculars um, as your, as, as your, in the way that your other friends are going out, turning up at clubs or, or doing whatever 20 year olds do, you're doing the other thing. Okay. But, but it's for a greater gain in the future. And trust me, ain't nobody ever went to no bar, or no turn up or kickback and said it was worth it. So don't worry. The next question is, do you recommend pre-med students to take a gap year? And also they're giving a shout out to El Salvador. Hey! Shout out. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so if you need a gap year, um, I highly recommend that you take it, but don't take a gap year to just chill and go to Hawaii or don't take a gap year to go visit your tío in El Salvador, you know what I mean? Although the pupusas would probably be real bomb. Um, but I still say that it, you have to be intentional and strategic in every move you make, okay? People are playing chess out here, you know what I'm saying? Um, so don't play checkers. Um, so with that said, I think if you're in your gap year and you're doing research or you're doing something that's beefing up your app, you're doing something that's beefing up your GPA, then, uh, you know, or you're taking the MCAT, you're studying for the MCAT, like vigorously, then do that. But don't just sit by, like no more summers off, y'all. I'm sorry to say, after high school, it's done. No more summers off. So um, yeah, that's just the reality. Um, and I'm more than happy to tell you guys the reality because you guys are my people. The next question was, what it was a big takeaway when you found out about imposter syndrome and what was the first step into reaching out uh, for help or how you overcame it? The first thing I had to do was verify with other people that I wasn't going crazy, you know, verify with other people that this was a real thing, verifying with other people that had, you know, shared backgrounds that this is a, something that we were all going through. And sure enough, you know, everybody goes through it. You don't even have to be from my background. I have a friend who's well off from Beverly Hills and is now a doctor and he still feels like he doesn't belong. So we all have some form of it. Right. Um, and now it's just a matter of kind of using that to your advantage or as a strength in a way, you know, the way I feel I use it is that I always feel like I need to work a little harder than other people. But what that ends up doing in the end is just making me a better me. So it, it's not about other people. It's, it's ultimately just me overcoming myself and and in a way, destroying my old person and leaving my ego at the door and just working to be a better person tomorrow than I was today. Um, it's all about growth and uh, listening to people who are 10 steps ahead of you or even just one step ahead. You know, I, I, just because I'm a doctor doesn't mean I'm the best fit mentor for you. The best fit mentor for you could be someone who's just studying for the MCAT right now or someone who just graduated from undergrad. Um, so you just got to find that person. The next question is, uh, how did you graduate from med school in just three years? Was it an accelerated program, for example? Yeah. And I guess if you could explain more about that program. Yes, I see uh, uh, the, the link up there. UC Davis HPC is an accelerated competency-based and education and primary care program. It's a three-year track, uh, whereas there's a traditional medical school, you get your MD degree, MD degree in four years. Um, I also had the opportunity to join in an MD and PH program for five years, but ultimately it was, what, what's the goal, right? The goal is to take care of people. And I think UC Davis had a unique opportunity to see patients right away. You know, the first year as a medical student, I was taking care of patients in clinic. I was seeing patients on um, half days through the partnership with Kaiser in Sacramento. I was out there taking care of people in Clinica de Salud, uh, talking to my Spanish speaking population who I hold dear to my heart. And, um, that was, that, was, that was important for me to, to, to practice medicine early on because that, that's ultimately the goal. And you know, now my friends who are barely applying you know, or who just got into residency, you know, I'm, I'm a year ahead of them in a sense, but uh, at the same time, you know, they, they had a great time. So for, for your tracks, it's all good. Just whatever lines up with what your goals are. The next question is what parts of medical school uh, do you want us to hear about? Or for, I guess is what part of medical school could you say would excite pre-meds the most? So, so uh, spoiler alert, medical school is fun. Medical school is super fun because guess what? You're not doing any of that other cookie cutter stuff. You're not doing physics. You're not doing like all those other general elective stuff, you're just doing medicine, medicine, medicine. So in a sense, it's easier now because that's what you wanted to do this whole time. Uh, you're no longer having to do, what is it like OCHEM? Forget about it. After the MCAT, forget about it. So, um, you know, it's still important. Chemistry does come up in the form of biochemistry in medical school as it relates to disease processes. But at the same time, um, yeah, med school is super fun. You, uh, you know, it's like, it's the culmination of all your efforts, imagine. And then you're here, boom, you've secured the bag. Yeah, your, your future is set and, and you're, you're able to just do what you've always wanted to do. Um, it's fun. Y'all got to come check it out for sure. And then I guess the reverse of that question is what do med schools want to know about us when we're applying? 
Yeah, I think I, that's a loaded question because um, tell them everything. Tell them, tell them, tell them why why medicine. Tell them why you want to go to that school. Tell them what about that program speaks out to you. You know why their program versus versus another program. Um, what about your family? What about your story that 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 makes you a fit for medical school? You know, um, if 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 you had the opportunity, uh, why not do another another field? Right? There's plenty of other allied health professionals. Why exactly medicine or getting a medical degree? Um, they just want to know that you're genuine. They want to know that you're passionate, and they want to make sure that they're going to be able to help you in your endeavors to become the the ultimate and achieve your full potential. So that's how you know that you're a right fit for the program and, you know, shop around. These people want to help you. They, they, you're the next generation. You know, we, we want it. We're passionate about helping people. So uh, you just got to be genuine and, and, and try your best. That's it. So I'm, I'm going to make a plug. We've had almost every Dean of admission from a California medical school this year, tell you exactly for an hour and a half and they took some of them took like 75 questions mm -hmm. so uh, even though Dr. Soriano can talk about his personal journey and his experience um, he doesn't uh, he's not in their brain and so they've they've told you he could only talk about his personal experience and he's mentoring people from his own experience and knowledge but if you want what exactly they're looking for they've said it pretty in living color so uh, watch some of those videos i mean um there's no secret sauce but there are things that they look for um yeah and so uh spend some time looking at those and and uh and you know because dr soriano doesn't you know doesn't know what and the other thing is he applied to medical school, what, four years ago? Uh, 2018. Yeah. So four years ago. So things have changed and, and there, there are things that have uh, significantly changed. I mean, uh, there's this little thing called COVID and pandemic has have really changed many of the things. So, yeah, check those out. Thanks for the plug. Yeah, I, I highly recommend you all check that out. The next question is, how did your involvement in Mi Mentor and other activities help strengthen your desire to become a doctor? I mean, it just it just cemented everything. I mean, the, you meet the people who you're going to become in the next 10 years, and, and these become your role models. You know, for, for me, my role models were not doctors or people with degrees or educated people. So uh, for me, it was just a whole new world, and I... I, I I wanted a part of that because I saw how happy they were. I saw that they were doing, making a difference in, in, in other people's lives. Um, so these programs are just facilitating and giving you the, the, the inside scoop or, you know, the secret sauce, if there is one, into, into what you have to do to, to become your, you, you know, the person that you ultimately want to become and, and manifest your dream. So um, that that's what these programs do you know i could never have i could never have done this all by myself that that's crazy there's no way um you need help you need people who have done it before you need people who have made the mistakes so that you can learn from their mistakes and not repeat them um and uh you know i i, I advise you to just ask for help anywhere you can and join all these programs because they're all going to be instrumental in getting you to the next step so, so the same program that Dr. Soriano has been talking about, UCLA Med Prep, they have a program this year that's going to be virtual. So you don't have to be in LA. We've posted it and we've also sent that email out. So things that he did that helped him be successful, you should probably check that out. The next question is, uh, how slash why did you choose your specialty among the other specialties? Yeah, I, I think internal medicine encompasses, you know, the, the, the cowboy doctor, you know, the person who is uh, uh, well-versed in all systems of the body, you know, is someone who knows uh, uh, a little bit about a lot of things. You know, they're not so specialized into surgery where they only know surgery and uh, I, I like the idea of being able to know all disease processes and eventually if fellowship is an option, you know, you can go on and specialize into one specific system or, 
organ like you know the heart or the kidneys or the GI tract. Um, uh, so that that's that's also enticing to me. But uh, ultimately, I, I all my mentors mostly have all been family medicine or internal medicine. So I think that played a big part too in in showing me uh, what what kind of physician I wanted to become. But who's to say, you know, if I had an orthopedic surgeon as my mentor, it could have very well have been that I would be an orthopedic surgeon at this point. But, you know, just keeping your options open and, and finding what's best for you, what's a good fit. And ultimately, that, that's more important. And sort of piggybacking off of that question is what is a typical day in the life of an internal medicine doctor? Yeah. So, for example, this morning I got up at six o'clock. Um, I, I got in my car, got over to uh, uh, the hospital, checked in. I got sign out on my patients from there's a night float resident who's my colleague. Um, he was up all night taking care of all the patients in the hospital on our service. Um, and then after that, I rounded on my patients. I looked at their labs. I started their note for the day. I went in and checked in on all my patients, explained to them the plan, did a physical exam, checked in on how they were doing. Um, and then I rounded with the rest of my team. We have an attending who's someone who's already completed residency and has been practicing as an attending physician. Uh, and they're kind of overseeing us uh, and how we're taking care of our patients. And uh, we rounded with them. And so that happened all, of, all the way up until about 1030. And then I went and got some breakfast, got me a little coffee. Uh, then we had noon conference where we learned about different uh, quality improvement projects that UCLA is a part of. Um, and then after that, uh, just called consults for different specialties on my patients. And, uh, you know, if my patient needed a nephrologist to come check on, on them, then I called them. Um, and then that brings you right around two to three o'clock. And then I did some teaching. I was teaching some med students about skin and soft tissue infections and what antibiotics to use for different, uh, uh infections. Um, and then... I did feedback for my med students who came on because they did an excellent job and I was giving them pointers on how to improve to, to achieve that next level. Um, and then at four o'clock came around and so I signed out my patients to the night float. And then I got in my car and I got nervous because I remembered that I had this at five o'clock and then now I'm here talking to you all. And I gotta do it all over again tomorrow. <laughs> Can you speak of whether UC Davis School of Medicine focuses more on research or community service? Everything. Uh, they are well versed in everything. So it, it's all what you want to do. Uh, all the opportunities are there. It, uh, you just have to look for it. I myself, I did some research in undergrad, uh, realized that maybe it wasn't, you know, my mojo. Um, I could have done research in, in med school, but I chose not to. I chose to do more clinic. I chose to apply my knowledge and, and see patients as much as I can and see different disease processes. Uh, certainly in residency, I can start doing research in, in the next couple months um, so that I can tailor you know, uh, my, my experience to whatever I'm interested in. Ultimately, if I want to go into academic medicine, then I would tailor my research for that as well. So all the opportunities are there, guys. You, you just, uh, just got to find out what you're passionate about, find out what, what piques your interest, what gets you going, what makes you excited, and it, it'll be there. The next question we have is, do you have any advice on making friends amidst the competition and toxicity of other aspiring pre-meds? Yeah, I think you're, you're going to seek toxicity if, if, you, if you love toxicity, honestly. Um, you know, there's going to be people from different backgrounds uh, from yourself. There's going to be people who are still growing and maturing and still don't really know who they are. But ultimately, if you show up with your ego and leave it out, the, leave it outside of the door, then what do you have to worry about? Right. Um, so I think, you know, you, you will find your niche of people. You will find the people who speak the same language as you, who vibe with you. And those will be really the people that give you life in medical school, you know, when you're struggling or some things don't go as well as planned. But ultimately, you know, there's also, you know, we're human. There's people who are psychiatrists who are medical trained, medical, they're doctors. I have psych people who are, I have friends who are psychiatrists in residency and they provide a lot of therapy to patients who are undergoing mental health issues, whether or not they have undiagnosed depression, uh, generalized anxiety disorder. These are things that, you know, we all have or, or are undiagnosed and can potentially benefit from seeing a specialist for. 
So I implore you, you know, if it's if it's something's really bothering you, if you feel like you're just uh, in a rut, you know, go to your doctor and see if it's something medically that that can be uh, uh, optimized. Otherwise, you know, uh, uh, just try to grow, leave your, leave your ego at the door and try to talk to people. Communication is an ongoing skill that you have to build. Uh, some of the best doctors are just master communicators, really. Um, can you teach a patient how to take their medications correctly? Can you teach a patient the disease that they have? Can you teach a patient and their families how to take care of themselves? So uh, communicate with that person you have a tiff with and, and you never know, they might become your best friend. The next question is, being a first generation student, how did you learn to study and succeed in hard science classes without any guidance from other family members? Yeah, no, that's a great study. Nothing about my family says medicine. Nothing about my family says education. Nothing about my family says uh, MCAT A students, nothing like that. Um, so, you know, my I, I'm the first person in my family to have gotten, you know, I have two older brothers, but I'm the first in my family to have, you know, gotten a bachelor's medical degree and now in residency. Luckily, my, my two older brothers now are one's uh, applying for physical therapy schools, the other one's applying for physician assistant schools. So um, one of them is actually going back to community college to take classes to then, you know, beef up their application to then apply. So, you know, I, I think it, it's all I had the benefit of being the third in line in the sense that I was able to see my brothers and see what they did that worked and see what they did that didn't work. So in a sense, they had the ultimate sacrifice. They had the ultimate burden. Whereas I was just, you know, behind them, la, 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 la. They caught all the draft from the wind and I was just chilling behind them, you know, easy. So um, I think I, I, I knew that I didn't know anything. So I had to go seek out stuff. You know, my mom was always, you know, my mom cleans houses for a living and she, cleans houses for families where the son is a, a lawyer from Harvard or, you know, the, the daughter is a nurse at, you know, at Cedar sinai So my mom was very uh, 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 meticulous about asking them, yay, how, how do I get my sons into like this world? Um, so she tried her very best, although she couldn't teach us how to do calculus or teach us how to, you know, study for biology. At least she told us, you know, like you guys focus on school and we'll take care of the rest. So um, that meant for me, like, okay, I cannot let my parents down. Like I am, you know, I'm going to be the one that's going to have to take care of them. My brothers and I, right. They don't have social security. They're not going to get retirement that, you know what I mean? They're barely making ends meet. So in order to take care of them, I had to make this sacrifice too, which is minimal compared to the sacrifice they made. Um, so you just have to do everything and anything and, and, and your grades will be a reflection of that in the moment and your letters of rec, your experiences, everything will give you feedback. So take feedback from everything. The next question we have is what was your major in college and how uh, would you get into medical school without a STEM major or are you at a disadvantage without having a STEM major background? Yeah, I, I, I was a microbiology, immunology and molecular genetics major. So very heavy on the, the sciences, very uh, unnecessary to get into medical school, but at the same time, it made it easier because of the rigor. Um, I think that ultimately, if you're going to major in a non-STEM class, you have to be prepared in medical school to take those classes anyway, but without any foundation, and that's going to be difficult. A lot of my friends who took English or who took uh, anthropology or who took, or who took um, uh, you know, finance had a difficult time in those science classes. Did they pass with great grades? Of course, right? Because you're hardworking, you're interested in this, you're passionate about it, but maybe they had to put in a little more time than I had to at the end of the day because I've already seen it once or twice. Um, so that's something that you have to think about. But ultimately like college is, is not just about like, you know, getting the grades to go into medical school. It's about finding yourself, it's about growing, it's about, uh, uh, you know, developing this diverse portfolio, meeting different people, it's about growing. And so these classes are amazing, you know, anthropology or finance, all these things are super relevant to life. And, you know, don't feel like you have to do a STEM major to get into medical school. Um, if, you know, if you're passionate about it, uh, then, then you're going to make it. Don't, don't even worry about it. Don't, don't just do anything to, to get into medical school. Do, do what's going to make you happy at the end of the day. Uh, the next question sort of encompasses a few that we've received on the Q&A is more about um, 
study strategy. So how did you find the strategy of getting an A and how did your study strategies uh, transform as you moved from community college to uh, undergrad to med school? Yeah, I mean, so to, to you know, uh, spare no detail, I mean, let's say I, you know, in community college, I was living at home. So I would wake up before everyone. I would be at the dinner table already previewing for the day's lectures. Um, so let's say I got up like at seven, started studying. I had a class at eight or nine, got there. I already knew what, what the lecture was going to be about because I already saw it once. So I'm just sitting, my hands folded. Uh, I'm asking clarifying questions. And then right after I go up to the professor and ask clarifying questions again. So by the time I leave there, my knowledge of the subject is 85 to 90% done. Then that last 10% is reviewing, going back, going to office hours and doing the work to make sure that I understand that last 10%. And so by the time the next day comes, I've already previewed and, and you just keep building and building and building and getting ahead and ahead and ahead. So I did that and that was really the formula to get straight A's for me. Um, I'm not the kind of person, you ask anyone from, if anyone from high school is on here and you knew me from back in the day, you think I'm crazy. Like what, straight A's, that's crazy. But um, yeah, that, that was the formula. Uh, honestly, just putting in the hours. There's no secret. There ain't nobody smart. Nobody's smart. Everyone's just hardworking. So put in the 12 hours, put in the 14 hours. Our parents work 16 hours a day anyway. You can at least sit down and read words for 12 hours. It's fine. Okay. So just build your threshold of pain, build your perspective on what other people have to go through. Understand the privilege it is to study, to just sit down and get school paid for, or even having a loan to, to afford this opportunity, right? It's all about perspective and, and, um, yeah, just keep working hard. Don't don't settle. If you show up to your uh, chemistry or biology class, and if it's the first time you've heard this word, you know that you've messed up somewhere. Because everything the professor is telling you during lecture, you should have heard it. You may not understand it fully, but at least you don't have to sit there and say, well, what is an amino acid or what is a chain reaction, like a Krebs Kreb cycle, you know, if you have not heard this at the lecture, then you know you messed up somewhere. And you never go into a class without reading ahead. I don't care if you're at community college, med school, certainly in those classes, you know, or not knowing how to spell something like, or be totally freaking out. Oh, what is this word? So um, the professor is not grabbing these things out of thin air and, and telling you it's written somewhere it's most likely in a textbook and if you go to a UCLA probably the professor wrote the textbook themselves <laughs> exactly facts no I, I appreciate that input another thing I'll add is different studying techniques like looking up mnemonics or making your own mnemonic to memorize something like the Krebs cycle um, is is going to help you and you're going to remember it for all eternity I remember the Krebs cycle and I learned that, what, 10 years ago, and I still remember it because it's implanted in my brain with a mnemonic that I use. Um, uh, please don't quiz me on that right now. But um, I think also another thing uh, to mention is that, um, you know, uh, I already forgot what I was going to say. Next question. Sorry. Can you tell them what mnemonic is? Because most people yeah. may not know. A mnemonic is essentially uh, uh, an easy way to remember uh, a concept. So for example, if I'm thinking about uh, the, the, the disease, the uh, neoplastic disease called multiple myeloma, I don't know what multiple myeloma entails, but I know my mnemonic for it, it's called CRAB, right? So they're gonna have hypercalcemia, they're gonna have renal failure. A stands for anemia, B stands for oste uh, 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 osteoblastic lesions, right? So though that's my mnemonic for understanding multiple myeloma. Um, and you can do this for any concept. You can do this for the Krebs cycle. You can do this. And with the Krebs cycle, you just look around your room and you say, oh, there's a door or there's a chair. Um, and then you kind of just, oh, there's three, high, three carbons right there. Oh, that's pyruvate. Oh, uh, go to lactate, you know, stuff like that. So you just make up a story in your mind or a, a song and that makes it easier to remember. And it makes studying fun. Yeah. Uh, another question we have is why did you choose to become a doctor versus a nurse, PA, or other allied health professional? I guess, especially considering that you have family members that are going into those fields as well. Yeah, no, totally. Um, so I, I, my story, if I'm being transparent, was I was actually pre-dental. 
I was pre-dental um, when I first started because my introduction to like uh, pre-med stuff was in the form of getting dental insurance growing up. I finally got dental insurance. So I went to the dentist and then I got my wisdom teeth removed when I was like in, in college. And um, so uh, the guy was an oral maxillofacial surgeon who removed my wisdom tooth. Um, and he was like telling me, oh yeah, you can totally be a, a dentist and become a surgeon. And I was like, okay. And so like, I started like, he planted that seed in me and like, he didn't have to plant that seed in me. He could have just made his money and got in his portion and take off, you know? But um, he did that. And then I'm, I'm grateful to him for that because that was part of the, the many kind of catalysts into me going into it. Um, other things for me too, is like growing up, you know, I had an uncle who passed away at 50, at the age of 50 from uh, cirrhosis of the liver, um, which is an end-stage liver disease from uh, alcohol use disorder. Um, he was an addict, you know, he was an ex-convict, he was an IV drug user, and ultimately what got him was the La Botella, you know. So um, uh, I think seeing him pass away at LA County USC was, was, was different for me because I was so young and I didn't quite understand what was going on, but I, understand, I understood he was sick and that there were these people in long white coats taking care of him. Um, and then, so I was like, wow, that's amazing. Like these people don't even know my uncle and they're, they're like really trying to help him survive. Um, ultimately he passed away, uh, but I think, you know, he, he still stays with me and I, and I honor him, uh, you know, in, in taking care of that patient population as well. Um, and, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, cirrhosis is a, and a late stage manifestation of a, a lifetime of issues, right? So. I can only imagine what I could have done for my uncle had I been a, his doctor or his primary care doctor early on in his 20s. But, you know, that's why we got to pay it forward. Uh, a couple of questions has, have asked what was the transfer process like from community college? So if you could just describe yeah. what that was like. So I went from a semester system to a quarter system. So let's say I had, I don't know, 24 weeks to learn organic chemistry in, in community college. Well, now I had 10 to 12 weeks to learn physics or, uh, you know, biochemistry in, uh, at UCLA. So it was, a, it was a, a change in the way I had to study. So I became more efficient. I became quicker. Um, and, uh, you know, knowledge builds on itself. So things came a little easier as, they, as you progressed through your, through your higher education classes. Um, but the transition was not that bad. I, I maintained who I was. I, I continued to get better. I continued to ask around and seek advice and what's the secret, what's the strategy to get an A at a, at a top institution in, in the country. And it was no different. You just study. That's all they did. That's all those smart kids did was study. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do the same thing. And it, 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 it worked out. So no secret. You just got to put in the work, you know? Yeah. There is that saying that for every hour you lecture, you're supposed to study two to three hours um, mm. outside of it. So just being honest with yourself, if you're not doing that, you know, um, and these are from really smart people that give that data. So if they're saying that and you're not, then somebody's wrong. You both can't be wrong. So. Another question is what special programs or research programs did you partake in during your summers? So for um, when I was in community college, I was a clinical care extender. I think they call it Cope Health Scholars. Uh, that was something I did at St. Francis in Linwood, um, close to Long Beach where I'm from. Um, another thing I did was um, ESHPEP or SMDEP. Uh, which is a paid internship where I lived on campus at UCLA and attended like, you know, pre-med things. And it was like close partnership with the medical school there. Um, another thing I did was uh, uh, quality improvement research um, through, um, uh, through Ronald Reagan when I was an undergrad. Um, so I was always busy. I never really had any summers off. So I was always doing something. Um, I had my hand in a lot of different leadership positions as well, um, like, uh, you know, through LMSA or CCM volunteering um, or through MedPEP as a mentor. 
um, and also just tutoring, uh, tutoring. And then I was an R, I was a residential assistant at UCLA for one summer while I was taking summer classes. So, you know, you just got to stay busy. You just, there's no time to, to really lollygag. Yeah. Someone asks, uh, how is the path to becoming a doctor? Sorry. How is the path to becoming a doctor different if we already have a certain idea of what we want to specialize in? I think the sooner you know, the better. Um, because, you know, now you, you just tailor your whole experience to that one thing. The only thing I would caution you about is, well, have you worked with that field? Have you worked within that field? Have you seen how the lifestyle, is that the lifestyle you want? Is that the type of people who you want to surround yourself with? You know, um, are you okay with sitting in a basement and looking at x-rays and CT scans alone? Or do you see yourself as someone who's social and you need to be around a group of 15 people? Um, you know, or do you want to talk to people? Do you want to stay quiet? So knowing yourself and kind of what field makes sense for you to be in ultimately and where you see yourself practicing for 50 years, you know, you're going to be doing this job for a long time. So uh, whatever makes you happy. And uh, I think the best thing to do is shadow everything and don't close any doors, leave all doors open. Uh, Cause you never know. Uh, you could, you could think that you're going to be a cardiologist and end up being an ob guy doctor. You never know. So just leave every opportunity open. Another question was, what was the most challenging aspect of going to med school and how were you able to balance your academic, personal life and other relationships? Yeah, I mean, after you, you exclude sacrifice and every sense of the word, you know, sacrifice, you know, with you know, relationships, your personal family, your, your immediate family, your partner. After that said and done, I think the most difficult part, uh, aside from that, which everyone goes through, um, I think mostly is, um, let's see, I think staying uh, hungry in the sense that like, you're, you're already there, right? You're, you, you've already got in, so but now what's the next step, right? You can't get complacent you have to continue the fire you have to spark the fire and, and the way you do that is you find things that sparked your fire or interest before um and you know and just being overall a a diverse person in the sense that you're not just a bookworm but also you're you know you're mentally healthy you're physically healthy you're emotionally healthy right so working then your 20s is the time where you grow the most and in medical school, you can you can lose track of what that is, because while everyone else is out there living their lives outside of medicine and growing, you're kind of stuck in this like student role. But don't forget that you also have to grow in, in other parts of your life as well. So, um, you know, just just welcome every opportunity and, and continue to grow. Yeah. Another person asks, how did you prepare for your medical interviews? How I prepared for my medical interviews was I went to all the doctors that I knew and I said, hey, um, you know, uh, I've never done a medical school interview before. My, my parents don't know anything about this. Uh, how can you help? Uh, what, 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 what do I need to do? And then, of course, they, they take the wheel and they show me the ropes, you know, so they give me mock interviews. They give me mock questions. I was a part of different groups that already had pre-filmed questions and mock interviews style. So I showed up in the suit you know, and I, and I sat down, you know, and I, I did the whole thing. And um, you have to seek out those opportunities, but at the same time, uh, mostly just getting your story straight, understanding why you wanna go into medicine. As, as long as you understand why you're doing what you're doing, they could throw any question at you and you will have an answer. Um, so, so just be true to yourself, learn what your weaknesses and strengths are, learn everything about yourself, dig deep, dig deep and go into your innermost thoughts and try to, Try to tease out every little detail about you, your, your life, and why you're doing what you're doing, and, and they can never stump you. Um, and that's that's what you know. Part of your story is all these extracurriculars that you do, all these trials and tribulations. You know, not getting a good GPA in community college, but then eventually getting a good GPA. So all that is a part of your story, and you're building and you're building. So just continue to to build. Another person asked, did your community college GPA follow you or, and, and, or was your university GPA different or separate? Yeah, I, it certainly did follow me. When I applied to medical school, my community college was half of it, right? So it all factored in, it all kind of averaged out. Um, ultimately, um, 
you know, I, I applied and, uh, you know, I, I, then they totally forgot about it. Like after you're in med school, no one cares anymore. So, um, now it's what you do in medical school, right. That matters for the next step. So you just have to make that, that next hump over and then, uh, you'll be good. Yeah. The, the mistake people make is if you transfer from JC to UC, when you graduate, your community college GPA is not there and it's only your UC GPA. But when you apply to medical school, every single class that you take in will be on your application. So um, no, no rest. What is it? No rest for the. Anyway, there's a quote that you can't relax or anything. So everything will follow you. Yep. How did you stay motivated on your pre-medical journey despite academic setbacks? How I stayed motivated in my pre-medical journey despite the academic stuff? Um, I'd say I had a life outside of medicine, you know? Um, I'd say that medicine wasn't the most difficult thing I had to do. Um, I'd say I was uh, at an advantage from having all these other obstacles in life just coming up where, where I came up from to where I was able to just have the perspective of being able to just sit down and study like that's the easiest thing anyone can do so aside from academic stuff i think it was also just um seeing how much i grew apart from my background or or seeing how far i grew apart from my the people from my own community and it's not that i was intentionally trying to um uh, grow away from them. It was just life, right? Just life happening. I think I was just growing. It's just a growing part of a maturation process. So, but I welcome growth. I, 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 I'm, I'm happy that I am who I am today. And, uh, you know, part of that had to do with sacrificing old relationships with friends, you know, people who, if I didn't go to college would still be my best buds, but, um, you know, that's part of, that's part of, uh, what you have to do. And, um, uh, what kept me motivated still was just uh, the other people who I've met along the way and have formed new relationships with. Um, so, uh, you know, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm like, a, I'm easy to talk to. I'm like an extrovert in a way. So I, I, I love it when people are welcoming of me and I'm, I'm welcome other people. So um, it's very easy to, to, to stay energized about this whole thing. Another person asks, as a person who went through community college, how did this influence your perspective on attending UC Davis after transferring and entering medical school? Yeah, I, I felt no different uh, as a community college student. I felt just as uh, prepared. I felt just as competent. I felt just as competitive. Um, but I actually felt more at an advantage, honestly, coming from community college because I met the most amazing people, you know, you, you meet people who are in the, in the military and have already have a family. I've met people who this is like, they're doing pre-med classes while also working full time and taking care of a family and met people who have had career changes. And um, there was just so much life and breath at community college, whereas people go straight into universities, you kind of, everyone's the same. They didn't really have a story prior to this. They were just in high school. So they just went straight through. So that's one thing that I, um, was able to gain was an advantage in meeting a diverse amount of people. Um, and then myself being diverse and having a story different from my, my colleagues, but then having something to bring to the table and learning from them and then learning from me and it ultimately benefiting patients. Um, um, yeah. Another person asks, I don't have any research experience and I graduate this spring. Does that hinder my acceptance to medical school and which no. medical schools uh, like more clinic community experience versus leadership and research? Yeah, I, I, I'd say I have a lot of friends who didn't do any research and are still went into medical school and are now using residents. Um, I think that uh, none of these things uh, hurt you. It, it can only help you, right? If you did research, it can only help you. Um, but it's not the end all that you didn't do any research. Ideally, you know, you would have something, um, but ultimately research will always be there. You can always do it in medical school. Um, as long as you had something else to bring to the table, I think that they'd still want to see that you had other extracurriculars, uh, 
that that showed that you were passionate and that you were somebody who can close. You know, you're a closer. You can see a project through the completion or you can see a certain task, a leadership position through the completion that speaks to you as a leader, that speaks to you as someone who's responsible. Um, I think that's also important and uh, you don't necessarily need to do research or public publish anything in the New England Journal of Medicine. So, Yeah, we had the deans of admission from uh, Hopkins, Stanford, UCLA that are big research schools that said that they've had students that have not no research. So don't believe us, just watch the video. <laughs> We got all the answers over here. <laughs> Sorry, there's a noise somewhere. Um, next question is, what would you tell your 18 year old self today given all the experiences with life, med school and now residency? I'll say it was good, bro. Um, you're about to embark on this crazy journey that you don't even know is, is gonna change the course of your Family is going to change the trajectory of your whole bloodline, change the trajectory of your whole family, and you're going to inspire so many people through what you're about to do, and it's going to be totally worth it, and uh, you you don't even know what's coming. Um, but then also say, you know, don't be so hard on yourself. Uh, I would say, you know, spend that that extra hour with your family. I know you, you're thinking of that next exam. I know you're thinking about going to work the next day, but when you're with your family, when you're with your loved ones, be with them in that present moment. I would say, um, you know, take that take that extra day off to go hang out with your friend who you haven't seen. You know, take, take that opportunity if your friends invite you to go eat, go eat, that's fine. You can do that. Don't feel guilty for uh, studying or don't feel guilty for uh, going to volunteer. Um, you know, yes, all those things are what you're passionate about, but also, you know, you have other people who care about you, who you also have to feed and nurture that relationship. So um, ultimately, you know, proud of you, bro. It's crazy that you did this um, and just continue to help other people who who needed help uh, like you and uh, just, just continue to build. I was wondering when these questions would pop up because most of the time we can't make it this far without discussing uh, the MCAT. So how did you study or prepare for the MCAT? Yeah, I put it on a credit card. Um, my dad uh, told me, he's like, you know, uh, I can't afford this. I can't pay for like a Kaplan course or something. But, um, you know, I told him I'd pay him back. Um, it was like, I think $1,000 to like apply to take this MCAT course, which is like an insane amount of money. Like I, I was like blushing asking my dad about it anyway. But like, he was like, let's do it. He put it on a credit card and, you know, um, I, I did, there were people in there who are, are still my colleagues. And I honestly, uh, I couldn't have done it without that help. I think I, I, I honestly think it was worth it. It was worth the thousand dollar debt that, that was eventually an investment. Right. So it, it, it paid off. Um, so I would, I would, uh, if you have the money, go for it spend the money on, on that. But um, if you don't, yeah, it, it's going to be tough, but it's going to be worth it at the end of the day because I've paid my, my dad off way more and I'm going to continue to pay them more in the future. So it's all good. A few people have asked sort of similar questions um, along the lines of this one. So I was a straight A student in community college, but after transferring, I have started getting more uh, B's or lower grades due to the rigorous quarter system. Can I still get into medical school despite those grade drops? Yeah, you could. You could still get into medical school. Um, I would uh, uh, focus on finding out what that last gap is. I would figure out why you're getting the B and not the A minus or the A. Um, and that can be in the form of, uh, you know, going straight to your professor, going straight to the source and listening it, hearing it from the horse's mouth, like this is what you're doing wrong. This is what you uh, need to change, right? Because you can't use the same community college studying techniques in a quarter system. It's just too quick. It's different. You got to change your studying reg regimen. You got to change your 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 strategy. So you got to ask around. People who have been there before you. Ask them what's going on. Go up to the person that that you know created the curve in the class and ask them, like, well, yo, can I can I study with you? Like, how are you going about this? Um, so don't think that what you did in the past is going to work in the future. 
you should always be growing. You should always be reframing your strategy. You should always be changing it up uh, because things, things change. Um, and um, yeah, I think you can still get straight A's. Uh, actually, you just have to reform your approach. And it's going to suck because you're going to have to change. No one likes to change. Um, but you're going you're gonna to be thankful for it uh, in the future. And then also, um, yeah, you'll, you'll get into medical school because you, you want to. I think to put it in a sports perspective, the uh, semester system is like running a marathon versus the quarter system is running a sprint and training for those are very different. And so probably have to change your training, but also the content is probably more challenging. So you're going to have to learn the, the adapt adaptability. Definitely. The next question is, as a community college transfer, did you directly major in microbiology or switch into it after you transferred? And if so, which year? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. People do like the, the backdoor thing where they go in one thing and then go into the other thing. I, 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 I heard that that's a thing and that's a great strategy. I wasn't that clever. I did everything I had to to go directly into that major, um, which was like a, I didn't know, but it was like a very... Uh, competitive major, I guess you can say. They don't take a lot of transfer students, uh, but it was interesting to me. So I, I tailored my whole application. I tailored my whole, all my pre-meds to get there. I spoke to the admissions director at, at the undergrad campus. I spoke to the transfer counselor, said, what do I got to do to get here? Like, like, tell me what I'm doing wrong. Tell me what additional things, what additional classes I got to do to prove to you that I want to be in this thing. So um, I knew everything. I knew I knew all the cheat codes uh, in the sense that other people already knew, but I had to figure out um, so, um, yeah, just, just figure out what you need to do to get there, um, or be clever and, and do the, the backdoor thing. There's no fault. Either way, you got the same degree I did from the same university. So it's all good. Another question is, did you work during undergrad school or gap years or summers? Or yeah. Yes, definitely. I had to work uh, in order to afford different things. You know, although most things were paid as, you know, my estimated family contribution on financial aid was basically zero. You know, we were, you know, uh, what do you call uh, low income? So definitely got all the fast, food, definitely got all the financial aid, all the scholarship stuff. But on top of that, you know, you still got to live in Westwood in a college campus. They, they gouge all the prices. So you have to pay, you know, an arm and a leg to, to live there. Um, so I definitely had to work. It was in the form of tutoring. It was in the form of a uh, clerical assistant. It was in the form of, uh, summer jobs, uh, like being a residential assistant. Um, so there are ways to come off scotch-free and you just have to find them. So residential assistants, when you live on campus and they pay for your board or your boarding and you pay for your meals, um, that was one thing. And then I applied to every scholarship that I could find under the sun. I applied to the ones that particularly were specific to who I was, my demographic, my background, but then I also applied to broadly to other stuff um, because no one applies. Um, you know, right now there's someone out there applying for a scholarship that you're qualified for, but they're going to get it because you're, you're just, you're not even looking for it. So, um, you know, you're, there's a, a income opportunity that is lost. Uh, so you just got to go out and get it. Um, another question is, I'm just starting to explore healthcare careers. Can you please explain how you made your decision to go into MD versus DO or PA route? Yeah, no, totally. I, I think that, um, I think I, I knew what I, I knew that I wanted to help people. I knew that I wanted to be in a hospital and, and treat people, you know, medically. Now, I didn't know exactly the difference between PA, DO, MD until I got like into the pre-med world. Um, but all my mentors were MDs. I didn't get the opportunity to work with the DO. I didn't get the opportunity to work with the PA. I feel like that's something that you have to come across or seek to, to gain those opportunities. So unfortunately, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even able to entertain those things. I, everything that I did was tailored to becoming an MD. So um, I can't really speak on those other things, but the people who I've met, they're all the same. We all want to help people. Uh, we all are passionate and uh, we all want to learn more and, and uh, going to this field, this uh, amazing field that's uh, very gratifying and it, and, it, and it gives back a lot. Uh, it's very fulfilling. Um, so I guess if I had to say I chose MD because that's just all I knew. Um, sorry, yeah. 
Another question is, would you recommend double majoring or minoring in a science like microbiology? I would recommend you do whatever's going to make you happy. Um, I, I don't think it would make you a better candidate for medical school. I don't think it makes you like more competitive. Um, I just think that it's, it's whatever you're passionate about, then you should do that, right? Because um, I just did one major and it worked out. Other people do one major and it works out. But other people, yeah, certainly do double majoring. Um, I think if it becomes too difficult, I don't think you should do that. I think you should know yourself and know the workload because it's already going to be difficult already doing one major. Um, I don't think it's worth tacking on an additional year just to complete that major because then that's time lost from medical school. That's time lost from potential income as a physician or a physician assistant or a nurse. So think about the downstream effects of the time you're spending to do these other things when ultimately the goal is to go out and practice. Yeah, I think the, the Dean of Admission from UCLA or USC said that if you are a single major and you have a 3.9 GPA, then you're a double major and you have a 3.4 GPA, who do you think is going to get in? So. Yeah. Yeah. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. And what looks like our last question, unless any other ones pop up in the Q&A, um, is could you explain how you actually adapted from the semester to the quarter system? Yeah, let me try. Um, so the way I did it, um, I just asked around. I asked people who have already been there since their freshman year. And I asked like, yo, what's this whole quarter thing about? Like, how quickly do I need to study? Like, basically, everything I did in community college had to just be condensed into a shorter time frame, essentially. But then also, I had to utilize more um, uh, test banks. There's like these test banks that you have access to that are old exams, or there are professors that hold office hours. I would go to all the office hours, ask all the questions, all the dumb questions, all those, you know, how they say there's no stupid questions. Um, I asked all my stupid questions. So, um, but that's what allowed me to then understand the material better and then in the end manifest in the form of a good grade. Um, so I just did everything. I, I, I did the most, I did, uh, not the minimum, you know, um, cause, and that's what it's gonna take from you too. Like when you feel like you're doing the most, that's when you know you're not doing enough. There's always another layer. You gotta make your ceilings, your floors and build and build and build, okay? There's like a Fortnite game where people build a layer. You gotta do that too. Um, so. I think, um, yeah, don't settle. You can always improve and ask around, like ask for help. Like these people know what's up. So don't think that you have to go through this alone. Um, yeah, it's impossible to do it alone. Another question that has come up is, uh, why was mentorship so important for you and how did you go about seeking it out? Mentorship was everything. I, I mean, who am I? I don't know anything. What is even, a, what is a bachelor's degree? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I'm not that, I wasn't that guy in high school who was, you know, destined to go to college and, you know, become a doctor. And none of that makes sense. You look at my background, my story. So um, it was just about, you know, asking around like, oh, wow, you're a doctor. What is that? What does that entail? What did you have to do to get there? wait, well, you have to do how many years of school? You know, all the little details, all the things that seem obvious to you weren't obvious to me. So I had to ask, I just asked and asked and asked and asked. And eventually I became a person who be, started getting questions and questions and questions because I became so knowledgeable on this whole thing. And, and, and now I'm a, a leader by default and someone who, um, you know, can help others because I just, I went through it. Um, so uh, yeah, seek mentorship and become a mentor also. Um, pass it along. Pass it. You have a lot of good information that can help other people. Um, and uh, just, you know, go to every single pre-health thing that you can go to. Uh, you know, you're going to learn from everybody. You're going to network with admissions committees. You're going to network with people from different the, the medical school of your dreams. And that's honestly, I think one reason why I am where I am now is because I, I, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I, I, I've sent a couple of emails that I feel like have came to fruition in, in the form of me being here. So uh, yeah, just, just put yourself out there. Um, yeah. 
And just make you a plug, uh, Dr. Godoy, somebody that you know, um, did a, an hour and a half presentation on mentorships and how to interact with a mentor. Yes. Um, so you could watch it. Somebody that Dr. Soriano knows. Yes, yes. Cardiothoracic surgery. That's the man. <laughs> Another question that's come up is what exactly is internal medicine and what about it caught your interest? That's awesome. Great question. So internal medicine is uh, the person who's a general uh, physician for adults. Uh, we don't see children. Um, that's more so family medicine or pediatrics. We mostly see people over the age of 21. Um, and that can be in the form as a primary care physician, or if you are, you come to the ER, you need to be admitted into the hospital. Um, we are the ones who take care of you there. We handle every organ system. Um, there are very few organ systems that we're not well versed in, like say maybe the brain, we consult our friends in neurology. If you're a woman and you come in and you're over the age of 21 and you're having, you know, uh, uh, issues, uh, with reproductive health or women's health, we consult our friends in OB kind. Um, and they help us help you. But ultimately, we are the ones coordinating your care. We are the gatekeepers. We are the ones who are uh, um, in charge of, of, of figuring out what's wrong with you and then ultimately diagnosing you with something and treating you. Um, and we are investigators. We're, uh, we're very cerebral. We think a lot. We, we, we try to understand the disease process that's going on. And this is the typical doctor you think of um, who's like, uh, in a sense, smart and can uh, gather a history from a patient and come up with a diagnosis. Um, so, and then this is also the person who can specialize in a specific organ system. Maybe they can go on to become a cardiologist, gastroenterologist, a nephrologist, a endocrinologist, um, a rheumatologist, a hematology oncologist, right? So you can specialize after your three years of residency. Um, so it, it's, it's the best field, honestly. But again, don't close any doors, you know, stay open up to everything. Hopefully, um, <clears throat> our final question is, if we have the opportunity, what would you recommend asking a physician for about future knowledge? Like, what are the best questions to ask? Yeah, honestly, anything that you're curious about, don't feel like you have to have this, like, uh, template that you have to go off on. Like, anything that comes off the tip of your tongue is, is fair game. Uh, just genuinely be interested, genuinely be curious. Um, and, uh, you know, I think just asking them about themselves. We love talking about ourselves. You, I'm literally been talking for an hour and a half, you know? So just, just ask them about their journey to medicine, ask them, um, you know, what they did to get to where they are now, what, you know, all the questions you're asking me really are, are all the good questions. Uh, but then ultimately uh, also asking them what they would have done differently or uh, asking them, you know, uh, would they do it all over again? Or uh, what brings them joy about their profession and what do they do outside of medicine that brings them joy as well? Um, all these things are pretty, pretty fair game. Um, yeah. I think one last one that's popped up in the chat is I have a 2.0 GPA, um, but a lot of the scholarships that I'm looking to apply for have a 2.5 minimum GPA cutoff. Should I still apply? So if they have a 2.5 hard cutoff, unfortunately, it doesn't seem that they would, uh, you know, uh, uh, allow you to apply or make the initial screening process. But, um, you know, the fact that you have a 2.0, I think that means that you're at least like a C average, maybe B average. So um, that means you're doing, that means you're doing something that can be uh, uh, improved. Okay. That's all the C means is there's something going on in your life right now that is causing that. It's just a side effect. So now we got to figure out the root cause of why you're getting that C. And then eventually then you'll be able to qualify for these scholarships, right? So unfortunately the grades are a barrier to a lot of these things we've been talking about, but first and foremost, you know, what is your biggest barrier and, and, and uh, what is your biggest obstacle right now in this moment? Uh, you have to solve that first before you move on because otherwise you're just uh, never going to jump over that obstacle. So um, I think, you know, uh, uh, revisiting kind of with the counselor, revisiting with yourself, you know, leaving your ego at the door and really trying to understand and interpret what's going on in your life that's causing this. Um, uh, and, and know that you can improve, um, that 
you you uh, are just uh, missing something. Well, I think we're going to let you go because our promise was to keep you till 6.30. And, uh... <laughs>